a pleasure to be here as a part of uh, this lunchtime seminar. I'm sorry, I can't be there in person, but those are the times that we are dealing with at the moment. I have chosen a subject which is certainly not pure epidemiology, but is a tribute to epidemiology as one of the key elements that must inform and influence public health and through public health, public policy. This talk reflects my appreciation for epidemiology as a strong scientific discipline and my aspiration to apply epidemiology to advance public health policy and practice. But let me start with a few affirmations which lie beneath my construct for this talk. I believe that the spectrum of science is reductionist in content, but holistic in context. Just as we appreciate the vibrant individual colors of the rainbow, but recognize the totality of sunlight, which actually feeds the rainbow spectrum as the ultimate experience under which we view the truth. Therefore, we must also recognize that science must be holistic context, even individual relationships through a reductionist approach. I also believe that science has a social mission, that science is sterile if it lacks a social purpose. But at the same time, public policy will crumble on clay feet if it does not stand on the strong base of sound science. And therefore, science must connect with public policy. And there, public health has a tremendous role for promoting, protecting, and preserving the health of society. Public health must provide the right steer to public policy and practice across multiple sectors which impact health. And there, I believe epidemiology must provide that steer and the ability to move ahead in terms of ensuring that public policy serves societal good. So in a sense, public policy provides the GPS as science and public health steer public policy towards the benefit of the larger society. What is public health has been defined in very many ways. And indeed, John Cogan in his book, What Makes Health Public, says there are seven phases of public health. I will not try and define each one of them, but the Institute of Medicine provides what is conventionally accepted as the definition of public health. When it says that public health is what we as a society do collectively to assure the conditions in which people can be healthy. But that is a bit of an idealistic construct because it assumes that all of society can harmoniously come together collectively to decide what is good for all of society. Recognizing that there are contending forces be they the tobacco industry or the industry that pushes ultra processed foods, or there are influences that actually negate the value of COVID-19 vaccines or preach against the use of masks. Therefore, that harmonious consensus is not always assured. And therefore, in that environment, we must certainly find the right way to achieve the maximum good for society. Therefore, I, I look at public health as a collective scientific confluence that identifies and influences determinants of health at the population level to impact on health and disease at the individual level. Therefore, it deals with risk factors, but also deals with the determinants of those risk factors 
and tries to influence all of these through several interventions, which may involve policy, systems, services, and community action. But we also recognize that there is a cascade of health determinants. For long, epidemiology focused on the individual, looking at what are the causal elements of disease by looking at beliefs which are acquired, behaviors which are practiced, and biology which results from gene environmental interactions in terms of how the biology is determined. But over time, it recognized that there are further upstream factors like the perceptions which are cultural, priorities which are socioeconomic, like do you spend more money on tobacco or alcohol or on nutritious foods and on pathways of available access, like for example, are they, uh, are they available smoke-free public place or community recreational areas which are pleasurable and at the same time safe. There are many areas which act at the community and family level as more upstream determinants. At the same time, we recognize that there are global and national factors which also influence, and increasingly, they are much more influential in terms of determining the health of individuals and societies. And these are the stage and speed of development, the distributional issues of equity, and some issues of trade. And they downstream at the left, the community, the family, and the individual to determine the balance between health and disease at the individual level. And epidemiology explores all of these now and is gaining strength. It has excelled in independent attribution of variables to cause and effect by paying attention to the interactions. And in the era of the microbiome and the epigenomics, it has transitioned to adopt integrative epidemiology as an investigational platform and life course epidemiology as an important field. The interactions between the metagenome and the super phenotype are being avidly studied as we look at how the combination of genes of the human as the microbiome that resides within the human constitute that kind of a metagenome and the super phenotype is composed of multiple social and environmental factors which influence the total phenotype. So social epi epigenomics and environmental epigenomics are burgeoning areas of research and potential application. However, the question needs to be asked, has epidemiology become adept at studying the complexity of interactions between multiple adaptive systems, especially when many of them are rapidly changing? Has its relatively a, a strong adherence to linear approaches been helpful in this regard? Has it helped to identify the critical points at which phase transition occurs in a complex system so that we can influence those transitions? As Fadi remarks in his essay on nutritional epidemiology, reality is complex and first obeys non-linear and multi-causal relationships. Indeed, as we are facing the COVID pandemic, we recognize that even viruses are complex adaptive systems, as this book from Ricard Soleil and Santiago Elena from Princeton very clearly describes. Starting from that, I started looking at how the COVID-19 pandemic is truly acting as an interface of multiple complex adaptive systems. We see the transmission dynamics in form of droplets and aerosols. We see the virus and its variants emerging and countering that the which are variants. We see non-pharmacological interventions in terms of policies and practice which are variably adhered to. And we see drugs 
which are again being evaluated in different clinical settings. We see the behavior of individuals and groups, which are not always determinate, but can be influenced by many other factors. And we see fluctuating levels of international cooperation between vaccine nationalism and global solidarity. At the same time, there are multiple unknowns as well. While all of these are complex systems, complexity does not permit linear models. So what are complex systems? They are co-evolving multi-layer networks as has been defined by Therma. In that we find elements interacting in a system which result in a behavior or an outcome that is more than the sum of its parts. Complex systems are highly composite, built from a large number of interacting subunits and further subunits are often composite in themselves. Their repeated interactions result in rich collective behavior that feeds back into the behavior of the individual parts. So you have the feedback mechanism and the resetting mechanisms, which ultimately result in a great deal of complexity. The key premises of complexity thinking are that there are a large number of dynamically interacting elements, non-linear interactions, wide diversity of elements. There is an emergence where as a result of these interactions, new forms may come in, which are different from the previously interacting subunits, unexpected variability, path dependence, self-organization and resilience. Indeed, this kind of complexity thinking has been very well ingrained into safety science, but have we in epidemiology really adopted this to the extent that it should be? Of course, while doing this, we need also to differentiate between complexity and chaos. Complexity is the generation of rich, collective, dynamical behavior from simple interactions between large numbers of subunits. Chaos, on the other hand, is the generation of complicated, aperiodic, seemingly random behavior from iteration of a simple rule. Chaotic systems can have very few interacting units, but they interact and produce very intricate dynamics like the beautiful Mandelbrot sets, which indeed could also be there in the manner in which multiple variants emerge from different parts of the world. But amidst all of this complexity, we must advance knowledge for societal benefit. We must ensure that knowledge is translated into action, not sterile action, but action which creates an impact, but not impact which is in a sense diffuse, but benefits only a few in the upper echelons of society and exacerbates health inequities, but it must in its ultimate objective, not only have impact across all of society, but bridge the health inequities that exist earlier. So it must promote equity as well. And therefore public health aided and guided by epidemiology must generate, translate, apply and evaluate knowledge using epidemiology as the probe. So research translated to knowledge, knowledge to action and impact must maximize equity in all dimensions which are biological, social, and economic. And therefore, when we look at equity again, for example, in the context of universal health coverage, the conventional definition is that all services must be available to everybody in society on an equal manner. But that is horizontal equity, where there is universal access to a common set of services an essential health package, however defined. But at the same time, we have an obligation to reduce the pre-existing health inequities. And therefore, there also has to be a component of vertical equity in which we have additional targeted services or additional resources to disadvantaged or vulnerable groups. Therefore, services beyond the essential health package 
must also be provided to those who are disadvantaged so that we can bridge this vertical inequity. And therefore, as epidemiology guides public health research, we must provide evidence-informed, context-relevant, resource-optimizing, culturally adaptive, and equity-promoting recommendations for policy and practice. I've avoided the term evidence-based because evidence comes from multiple sources. And the classic evidence-based has been very much focused on randomized controlled trials. Context relevant because the context can actually be shared in multiple locations. It need not be very specific to a particular group or of particular geography. Resource optimizing rather than resource sensitive. And culture, I believe, is dynamic and potentially modifiable, therefore culturally adaptive. But Evidence and equity must remain at the heart of these recommendations. And therefore, policy requires interdisciplinary research. Polit policy can be capricious, but even enlightened policy needs scientific credibility. Is there evidence and rationale aided by biomedical, epidemiological, and clinical research? Is there financial feasibility? Is the proposed intervention cost-effective? Even if it's cost-effective, is it affordable for the budget? We require health economics research. Is there operational steerability? Is it steerable? Is it sustainable? Is it scalable? Is there operational stability? Therefore, we require health systems research, that is implementation research. And finally, is there political viability? Is there a ready and receptive constituency among the policymakers, among the general public? Who is supporting? Who is opposing? How do we reconcile them? This requires social sciences research. And we see this complexity playing out in a very vivid manner in nutritional epidemiology, which started off with a focus on single nutrients and then decided that we could not really predict health outcomes or health benefits by focusing only on single nutrients. So we moved to food items and food groups and then finding that they too fail to some extent in predicting accurately the health outcomes. We went to composite diets and said we had prudent versus Western diets or other ways of defining composite diets and Mediterranean diets and so on. So we moved from a very reductionist paradigm to a much more holistic paradigm there. But we have come to the conclusion that we require dietary diversity, which again calls for crop diversity and different production methods. That means we have to address the food systems. And the food systems can be inimical or can be enabling for healthy diets. Therefore, we must mold the markets. Markets have been frequently regarded as a driving forces of how food systems are shaped, but they cannot remain autonomous and impervious to public health concerns. So they need to become sensitized and responsive to those public health concerns. And how do we do that? And therefore we also require not only national policies, but global nutritional governance, particularly when there are more of transnational factors influencing the nature of the food markets. And in this complexity, we have yet another element coming in, climate change, which can actually play havoc both with the quality and quantity of the kind of foods that we are producing, the crop, kind of crops that we are producing because of the nature of the heat susceptibility, the water susceptibility, and the multiple other areas in, by, through which uh, the climate change can affect the agriculture and food systems. So this calls for complexity science. But at the same time, we also recognize that there are commercial determinants of health, and particularly the food industry or the tobacco industry for that matter, argue that it's a matter of individual choice, that we ought not to really uh, play the nanny state and interfere through regulation. But then the counter argument is that choice is conditioned by many factors. Choice can be conscious either based on the correct information or the wrong information. It may be well-informed or ill-informed, like in the case of the masks or in the case of the vaccines. 
it can be conditioned by aggressive marketing and promotion like the tobacco industry does, like the fast food industry does, or by cultural factors, or it can be constrained by the availability factor, by the affordability factor. We may believe that we have the right knowledge of what food is good for us, but if the healthier foods are expensive and the unhealthy foods are less expensive and affordable, then the choice is dictated by the economic constraints rather than by conscious nutritional knowledge. So these are all the areas that we must explore and try and influence to find the right solutions at each level. How do we improve health literacy? How do we control the commercial determinants of health? How do we actually ensure that the healthier products become more available and affordable? And therefore, we must mold the markets and the markets are molded through consumer consciousness through industry practices where we actually emphasize the health dividend and try and offer incentives to the industry to change to better products or create disincentives for wrongful practices. A national policy framework is particularly effective in that area through political, economic, and social motivators, including fiscal instruments. And we need global covenants and global agreements, whether it is in the case of the Tobacco Control Treaty or in the case of vaccine sharing, all of these are important elements to decide the direction of the markets. But we also recognize that our knowledge of epidemiological transition must also influence how certain policy decisions are made and certain targets are set. If you look at what the UN high-level meeting on non-communicable diseases wanted as targets for the whole world, that was a 25% reduction in premature mortality due to non-communicable diseases in the age bracket of 30 to 70 years, a 25 by 25 target, which was then subsequently revised to one third by 30, but again in the 30 to 70 year age bracket in the UN Sustainable Development Goals to be achieved between 2015 and 2030. But this brings in the question of equity. What happens to people under 30 years? What happens to people over 70 years? Is there an ageism here? And secondly, what happens to only, uh, if we measure only mortality? What about morbidity measures, especially mental health? What about the disability due to that? But there is also another problem. In terms of dynamics of trans, this kind of a tax stall is inaccurate because we know that with transition across societies, countries move mostly to the middle age, whereas countries in mid transition will see NCD mortality split between middle and older ages, whereas countries in late transition will see NCD mortality mostly in the older age groups. So a 30 to 70 mortality target, which is uniform for everybody, for all countries across the world, does not fit all. It's good for exhortation, for policy level action, which is common to all countries, but for accountability, it doesn't work. What about epidemiology of fake news? We see pandemic denial, we see anti-mask protests, we see vaccine refusal. In classical epidemiological terms, what is the agent? Is the social media only a root of transmission? What are the origins of fake news? Who is, what about the host? What are the vulnerable minds who accept the fake news as accurate? What are the priors, to use a Bayesian term, that condition those minds? What about the environment, that is anti-science propaganda, toxic politics, business interests? And what kind of interventions can we try? What are the multi-component interventions that will be effective? Are they context dependent? Will they be globally impactful? And what are the indicators of impact in terms of process outcome indicators and outcome indicators? But even more upstream, who is funding? Who is controlling? Who is benefiting? And who, can, who is countering? And who is regulating? This is a complex area of epidemiology, but which needs to be addressed. Jeff Sachs, in an article in 2017, 
describes what the role of epidemiology is in the age of sustainable development. To quote, in an era of profound change and threat, epidemiology stands as the foundation of our public health response, providing rigorous data, modeling, and analytics to identify and anticipate disease burdens at population scale. Epidemiology itself must become global and systemic, meaning in particular that the big data generated by our information-rich global society should be systematically harvested and harnessed for insights and warning signs regarding public health. He goes on to say, epidemiologists should be trained in the broader dynamics of global systems change to anticipate the roles of climate change, habitat loss, water stress, pollution, lifestyle changes, dietary patterns, and other determinants of health, including substance misuse, depression, unemployment, forced migration, social exclusion, aging and loneliness, and so forth, in what is likely to be a rapid change of disease burden, including many new and major challenges. Indeed, he concludes by saying that the global scale-up of well-trained epidemiologists must be part of the SDG agenda, and the new generation of epidemiologists should be trained to work across disciplines with social scientists, earth system scientists, information engineers, and others to maximize the remarkable potential of the field. I know it is happening. I know it is happening particularly in Harvard, but we do need to do more. Indeed, we need to bring in a much greater Bayesian approach. As Nate Silver comments, information becomes knowledge only when it's placed in context. Without it, we have no way to differentiate the signal from the noise, and our search for the truth might be swamped by false positives. So the training of epidemiologists will require crafting competencies of change makers. Complexity matters, so we need big data from multiple sources. Context matters, so we need basic anal analytics and models. Comprehension matters, we need mixed methods research, quantitative and qualitative. Caution matters, so we need estimations of uncertainty. Communication matters, we need clear, coherent, consensus building communication. And therefore, we must train our epidemiologists to become public health change agents. And there, there is a great role for universities to create T-shaped individuals who can foster multidisciplinarity in thinking, research, and action. So we do require people who can develop a great deal of expertise. So we need T-shaped individuals who can develop a depth of expertise in several in domains of their choice. But at the same time, they should have familiarity and sensitivity to interact with other disciplines to generate that level of multidisciplinary integration of knowledge. So we require them to also have transdisciplinary thinking and real world awareness. And that is the role of universities. So there is an action almanac for us in epidemiology and in public health. First is to advance science, stream to social purpose, to assemble an array of potential allies, to adopt an agreed agenda, amplify advocacy, accelerate action, and ultimately assert accountability. And even to assert accountability, we need methods and measures which epidemiology brings. So thank you very much for the gracious invitation and the generous attention, for attention is the rarest and purest form of generosity, as Simone Weil remarked. Thank you. <laughs>